Hello, hello, hi there, everyone. So, our next talk again is about uh, React hooks broke my tests, and we have Daniel Afonso here. Uh, hey hi, Daniel. Uh, Daniel is a software engineer at uh, Talkdex. Uh, his current interest is in React and JavaScript, and he also advocates for better testing principles uh, using the testing library. He is a full stack uh, dev and worked with different languages and frameworks. He's also worked with a lot of various projects from IoT to fraud detection. Uh, in his free time, he's not learning uh, when he's not learning new technologies, he's writing about it or he's either reading comics. So, yes, hi, Daniel. How are you? Hey How are you doing? I'm, very happy. I'm great. Very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for being here at ReactJS Day. Uh, and over to you, Daniel. OK. Hey there, everyone. Welcome to my talk called React Hooks Broke My Tests. You know what? So I'll start by introducing myself. My name is Daniel Afonso, and I'm a software engineer at TalkDesk here in Coimbra, Portugal, where I'm part of the research and development lab. Besides this, I'm also an Altio ambassador. You can find me on Twitter and any other social network at the handle at DanielJCAfonso. My main ecosystem and the stuff that I focus most lately on has been the JavaScript ecosystem, React, and the testing library, which will be a great part of how this talk will go. So you might be wondering, what is this talk about? This talk is about a migration to React hooks that showed us that our tests weren't being done the way we expected them to be. During this process, we got to know the React testing library and the testing library family, which will be the main focus of this, of this talk. So during the talk, I'll give you the motivation of why did we migrate to hooks, followed by the process that got us to getting to know the testing library, and hopefully giving you a guide and all the tools that you might need for testing your components while using the React testing library. By the end of the talk, I'll list a couple of issues and mistakes that we have experienced while using the testing library on the, on the past year. So let's start with some context. We were in mid-2019 and we had a fairly new React Redux using project. At the time, React Hooks had been around for a couple of months, but it did, didn't have the traction that it had at the time. And we said, okay, let's start using Hooks our, at our project. And many asked, why? So before anything else, it's important to mention that hooks are the direction where the React team intends on taking React. They have mentioned it publicly, but being this not a great justification, I'll give you three other ones. So the first reason is code readability. Before hooks, we had lifecycle functions. And lifecycle functions are great, but they had one issue, which was unrelated logic together on the same function. With hooks, now we can write as many effects that we want by using the use effect hook and only put the related logic on each effect, removing responsibility from only one function and putting all the related logic together. The second reason is called reusability. So before hooks, there was no way to reuse stateful logic between components, I mean. Well, at the time we had mixins, but they were deemed unsafe, and then we have some other patterns like high order components or render props, but usually these patterns come at the cost of um, restructuring or adding extra code complexity. With custom hooks, this is now possible and so much simpler. The last reason is ease of teaching. Well, at the time, we knew that we would be hiring some junior developers to join the, our team. And we wanted their onboarding and ramp up process to be easy as possible and that they would be able to get into a React environment without many issues. With hooks, we wouldn't have to worry about teaching them how class components work, how event mining work, how this works from the start, and it would make it so much simpler to get into the React ecosystem. So, given these reasons, we started to work to work on migrating to React hooks. So here you can see us furiously typing while we migrated our entire code base from lifecycle functions to use effects, from set states to use state hooks, and the migration itself was pretty successful. Everything went well. Our app was working as it was before everything worked fine. We had almost half the lines of code we had previously. And 
everything was so much readable. At the time, someone remembered, hey, have you run our tests? And so we did, and this happened. Almost half of our tests were failing. And you could probably imagine that the only reaction we had was this one. So, we were left to wonder what happened, why are our tests failing? Everything works as it did before the page works as it, as it did. What's happening? And we did some research and we came to the conclusion that there was only one guilty party here, which was implementation details and writing tests that focus on implementation details. Right now you might be wondering, what are implementation details? So, as Ken Dot says, implementation details are the things which the users of your code will typically not use, see, or even know about. So putting this sentence in perspective, implementation details can be things like, well, the component state, uh, the props that the component receives, and so on. With this definition, when we, we looked at our tests, we came to the conclusion that our tests were full of testing implementation details. We were asserting that things like well, the comp state of my component is X or Y. We were asserting that the component received this prop or the other prop. And this was not the way that we wanted to test our components anymore because this meant that every time we change the component implementation, like for instance, this path from class to hooks, our tests would fail. And from this point on, we were pretty sure that we wanted to start writing tests that focused on a user-centric way. And this meant testing the components in the same way that the user interacted with them. And during this time, we got to know the React testing library. And from the point that we learned it more and got to know it even more, we, it was pretty clear to us that we had to stop using Enzyme. And from this point on, our focus was, well, let's migrate our tests from Enzyme to the React testing library. So before anything else, it's important to mention that Enzyme is great and it supplies a huge amount of tools to test your brand new components. The thing here is that often those tools can be wrongfully used to test implementation details, and even if accidentally. Right now I'll be showing you three examples that th of things that we found in our tests that encourage testing implementation details. So, the first one is shell ren rendering. Shell rendering is the way that Enzyme offers us to render our components in a shell way. What I mean by, by this is that Enzyme will only render the component superficial part and won't render the component children. So testing like this is not the way that the user interacts with your component. When the user interacts with your component, it interacts with the component in its entirety, with, its, with the superficial part and with the children of the component. The second point is find. Find is the way that Enzyme offers us to query for stuff on the DOM. It's the way that we can find our rendered component on the DOM. The thing with find is, is that it's not restrictive. And what I mean by this is that allows you to search for, well, for a class, for an ID, or even for the component name or the DOM. And this does not reflect the way that the user interacts, the user searches for things on the DOM, and it's not mm, really ac accessible. Last but not least, state. State, in my opinion, is probably one of the worst implementation details in this case, because by testing a component state, you are tying your test right to the current state of your component. And focusing on a user-centric perspe perspective again, the user doesn't care if the state of the component is 10, 20, or 30. What matters to the user is, well, if I click on this button, will some model open? Or if I click on this button, will this show some progress bar? And so on. So, as I mentioned previously, the reason for moving out of Enzyme was the testing library. And with the testing library came, came its main guideline, which is the more your tests resemble the way your software is used, the more confidence they can give you. This is a tweet by Ken C. Dodds, which was, which was responsible for creating the DOM testing library, which is where the React testing library is built upon. Speaking of, about the React testing library, now I will hopefully give you a guide to everything that you might need to use it. So, here is a snippet that shows a typical test while using the React testing library. Reviewing it and starting from the top, the first thing that we do here is import from the testing library React, the render function and the fire event, which is the way that we can fire events on no nodes. Then we describe our test and we say, okay, I want to render my component. And afterwards, I want to destructure from it a query, which will allow me to search for something on the DOM. 
In this case, I will be searching for something on a DOM that has a label text called a label. Afterwards, it will return the result of my query, assign it to my variable, and then I can fire some event on it. In this case, I'm firing a change event on my input to change its current value, to be some value. Afterwards, what I do is assert that, well, my input currently has the value some value. So, putting this in perspective, right now we are going to be seeing all of the tools and utils that the React Testing Library offers us to use in our tests. And we shall, be, we shall start with the render function. The render function is a function that will render the component that we pass it into a container which will afterwards be appended to the document body. Besides doing this, the render function also allows us to destructure a couple of utils from it, with, which are things like, well, the container where it's appended, a debug function, which is a function that shows us the current aspect of our component in the DOM, an unmount function to simulate the unmount event, a re-render function to simulate the re-render event, and besides this, it also gives us queries, which is what we are going to be seeing right now. So queries are the way we can search for nodes on the DOM. There are two types of queries, asynchronous and synchronous, being that the first two queries that we see here, query by and get by, are synchronous, and the find by query is asynchronous. They have different behaviors. And what I mean by this is the query by variant, it's a query that will find the first matching node and it will return null if it doesn't find it. While the get by query is a query that will find the first matching node, but if it doesn't find it, it will throw an error. Both of these variants are synchronous. For an asynchronous query, which will be a query for an example like, okay, we need to wait for, let's imagine a progress bar to appear. So in this case, we will use a find by variant. This is a query that will return a promise that will resolve when matching node is found or reject if there is no match. Both, both of these variants will only return the one and the first matching node. If we want to get an array of all matching nodes, then we should, do, should use the all by variance. What I mean by this is, imagine that if you want to get all um, elements that match the text all, for instances, then we will use a query like get all by, find all by, or query all by. So a question that I often hear is, which query should I use? And the answer is, you should always focus on queries that reflect accessibility. What I mean by this is, in the React Testing Library ecosystem, the queries try to follow accessibility to art. So, when deciding which query to use, you should always start with the order that's presented on this, on this slide. You should start with the queries that are accessible to everyone, then go to the semantic queries, then the test IDs, and if really none of the, the above ones work, then you should use manual queries as an escape patch. Now, let's see where every query belongs and a small example of the queries that belong to each family and how to use them. Starting with the queries accessible to everyone, these are the queries that reflect the experience of a visual, mouse or assistive technology users. The queries that belong to this family are the query by label text, the query by placeholder text, the query by row, the query by display value and the query by text. You should always try to use these queries first. If for some reason these queries don't work, then you should try to use the semantic queries. These are queries that make use of the HTML5 and are compliant selectors. These queries are the by alt text and by title. You should use these queries as a second um, choice because the user experience when interacting with these attributes, in this case the alt text and title, varies greatly across browsers and assistive technology. So that's why these queries should be only used as a second ch choice. Now let's see an example of a query accessible to everyone and a semantic query. Starting with an example of a query accessible to everyone, which is the get by label text. So the query is formed with the variant, which I showed you previously, which is a get by in this case, and the type of the query, which is label text. So before going more into it, let's imagine that we have this, our component is rendering this label and this input. This input has a label associated to it through the ID and through the area labeled by attribute. So imagine that we wanted to get this input on our, on our test. So firstly, what we would do is import the render from the React testing library. 
then we would render our component and we would destructure the query that we need from it. So as I mentioned previously, this is a query of a get by variant which and the type label text. And then we would say, okay, I want to get the query which has the label text username, which is this one. What the React testing library would do is, okay, let's look for a label which has username. It would look into the DOM, it would find this one, and it would say, okay, does this have an ID? Yes, it does, it's username label. Is this ID associated with something? And then it would find this input, which has the area labeled by, and then say, okay, so this input belongs to this label. We, what we are going to do is return this input. And it would return this input to be, to be assigned to this variable. And then we could use it for firing events or something else, but we'll get into it going along. Then the second example we have is the semantic queries. In this case, let's imagine that in our DOM, we have a span which has a title delete. So in this case, we are going to use the query by title. The process is exactly the same as previously. We render our we import the render, we render our component, we destructure the query that we want. In this case, a query of the variance get by with the type title. And then we say, okay, Hey, React Testing Library, find me on the DOM something that has the title delete. And it, it would look on the DOM and it will find it and it would return the, the span to be assigned to this variable. So, previously I mentioned that the um, semantic queries experience varies greatly across browsers and the assistive technology. In this case, the title attribute uh, is not consistently read by screen readers and it's not visible by default for sighted users. So, that's a thing to have in consideration when thinking about using these types of queries. Now, let's see the queries that by test ID and the manual queries. So before anything else, it's important to mention that these queries reflect implementation details because the user cannot see or hear them. But if for some reason, imagine that you have a deal for something that has dyna dynamic text or content inside of it that will vary and you probably need to get that deal on your test, then you should use a test ID. A test ID is a, well, a test ID that it, it's assigned to your component and will be rendered on a DOM and afterwards can be queried with a by test ID query. If for some reason the test ID query doesn't work, then you can use the manual query. And this is an escape patch and should we only be used like 0.001% of the times, but it's not a real query by the testing library, it's actually the query selector DOM API. So let's look into an example of a test ID query and a manual query. So starting with the test ID. Imagine, like I mentioned previously, that we have a div with dynamic content inside of it. Then the only way to get it would be by using a test ID. What we would do is, okay, into our div, let's add a data test ID attribute. In this case, it with a name custom element. So how would we go into, into getting it into our test? The process is exactly the same as all the other queries. We import the render, we render our component, we destructure the query that we want, in this case the variance get by again, and the type of the query which is the test ID. Then we would say, okay, let's find the DOM, on the DOM, the test ID custom element, and it will walk into the DOM and it will find it here and return this div to be assigned to this variable. You might be wondering, do we always need to use the data test ID? No, this is customizable. There is a function called configure from the testing library which you, you can call on your setup tests or on specific tests to configure the um, test ID attributes to be whatever you want. So going into manual queries, as I mentioned, this should be used as a REST resort only because this is an escape patch that allows you to search for class or IDs on the DOM and you should avoid that because that reflects implementation details. The process it's it's different. In instead of destructuring the query, what you do is you render a component, you destructure the container. Remember the container. The container is where your component is appended after being rendered, and then you can say, okay, in this container I want to query the selector that that is some selector foo, and to search the DOM for it. But in, as I mentioned, this is an escape patch and should be used only as a last resort. So now that we have seen queries in the order we should use them, let's see something that might be useful, which is custom queries. 
Custom queries can be created by using the build queries helper supplied by the React testing library. This allows you to create your own queries that fit your own needs. It's important to mention that if you decide to follow a path where you create your own queries, you create them in a way that encourages the developers to test your components in a user-centric way without focus on implementation details. Now that we have dealt with rendering, with querying, let's see how we can dispatch events by using the React testing library. So, the testing library, there are two ways that you can fire events. The first one being with the fire event util, and the second with the external library which you can use called the user event library. Starting with the first one, which is the fire event, the syntax to using it is pretty simple. First, you say, okay, fire event dot, and, what, and you specify what event you want to fire. Is it a change event? Is it a mouse over event? Is it a quick event? In this case, it's a quick event. So we say fire event dot quick, and we say, I want to click on a button that has the save name on it. Then what we are going to do is use the get by query role to get the node where that button is for the fire event to fire the event. But there is a thing here, is that the fire event will only fire a single event. And that's not how the user interacts with the button. There are a couple events that are fired when interacting with the button. The on mouse over, the, mouse, the key down, the mouse down. A couple, a couple of events are fired when you click on the button. And for this scenario, it's the exact use case for, for what the user event library was created. The user event library is a library that will try to focus more on the user-centric perspective way of firing events. The syntax is pretty much the same. We say user event, and then, in this case, the type of event we want to do, which is the quick event. And then we specify where we want to click. And in this case, it's exactly the same button with the save on it. So both cases fit your, your, the purpose that they need, but the user event library is much more user-centric when focusing on firing events. So now we have know how to fire events. Let's picture that we want to wait for a, place, a progress part to appear, for instance, or a spinner. How could, could this be done? Well, this involves waiting for stuff, right? Yes, it does. And in these cases, React Testing Library offers you a couple of asynchronous utils. The first util is the wait for function. The wait for function is a function that should receive an assertion as a callback that will be verified until it passes. So what I mean by this is we do the syntax. We say, I want to wait for a wait for function because this will be a promise. And we pass it a callback with our assertion. In this case, we are assert asserting that the mock, mock API has been called with foo. What it will do is we'll repeat the query inside of this assert inside of this callback until it uh, evaluates to true. And once it evaluates to true, this promise will be resolved, and it will get and it will get out of the wait for. For a second scenario that. Let's imagine that we want to wait for something to disappear from the DOM. And then in this case, we can use the wait for element to be removed, which is the syntax is pretty much the same as the previous one. We await for it and we say wait for element to be removed and we pass it a, a callback with a reference to the node that we want to wait to disappear. In this case, we want to wait for the label text loading to no longer be on the DOM and it will wait for it to disappear. So right now, we have all that we need to start writing our tests with the React Testing Library. But just in case, there are a couple of utils that might be helpful to you. There are a couple of helpers in the React Testing Library that person personally have helped me a lot in the last couple of months while using it. The first one is the within. So when we execute a query in the React Testing Library, the query will be executed in the entire container where the component has been rendered. Imagine that for some scenario, we would only want to run a query inside of uh, a div. Well, this is the use case for it. We would, use, we would import within from the, the React testing library, and then we would say, okay, from within our node, I want to run the query get by text, and it will run the query inside of that node. The second example is the screen. The screen is a reference to the entire container where the component is rendered. What I mean by this is, by using the screen, you can do almost everything that you did in, instead of destructuring the stuff from the render. So, looking a bit of this example and what we had previously, 
If you wanted to run a query, we would destructure the query after executing the render function. While well, using the screen, this no longer is needed. What you do is, is you import the screen from the React testing library, and then you say, okay, screen dot, and then you use the query that you want to do, you want to use on your on your document body instead of destructuring it from the render. Last but not least, we have the debug function. The debug function allows you to see the current aspect of your component in the DOM, or the entire DOM. The syntax is pretty simple. You either destructure it from the render function, or you use it by using the screen object, because it, it's attached to it for convenience as well. If you don't pass it anything to the function, then it will print the current state of your DOM. But if for some reason you want to see the current state of your component, then you pass the component, and it will show it to you. So, let's jump to today. We have been using the React testing library for over a, a, a year by now. And personally, I've never been more happier with the way I write my tests. They are full, free of implementation details, they can survive any non-feature altering or removing a refactor. And personally, I've started focusing more on accessibility since starting using the React testing library, all thanks to the queries. Our components are now even more accessible than before. As promised, before ending my talk, I'll show you a couple of mistakes and, and errors that we have done while using the testing library in the past year. So here are all the mistakes I'll be talking to you about in the next couple of minutes, and let's just start with ACT. When writing UI texts, there are tasks like rendering, data fetching, or user events that can be considered as units of interacting with the user interface. So React provides an helper called ACT that makes sure that all the updates related to these tasks, these units of interaction with the interface, have been processed and applied to the DOM before you make any assertions. So, putting this in perspective, this is a, the exact example where we should use ACT. So, we are rendering something, so we should use ACT on it, right? Querying, it's not a unit of interaction with the DOM, so we don't need ACT, but firing an event is a unit of interaction with the DOM. So, putting this in perspective, we probably should use ACT here, right? The answer is no. So you probably you almost never need to use ACT on the React testing library because all the tools that will end up causing units of interaction with the user interface have already wrapped the code inside of it with ACT for you so that, so that you don't have to do it. So inside of the code of the render there's an ACT and inside of the code of the fire event there's also an ACT. So you never need to use ACT on the testing library. The second mistake is using get by with expect not to be in the document. So expect not to be in the document is an assertion by just DOM that allows you to assert that something is not present on the current DOM. So if you go a little bit back when I talked about the get by variant query, I mentioned that every time that that query fails to find what it's looking for, it will throw an exception. So by writing a query like this, you're asking for your test to fail every time. So instead of using a get by variant, you should use a query by variant that will return null when it doesn't find what it's looking for. Using await with fire event or non-asynchronous queries. This one is pretty simple. There is only one synchron asynchronous query in the React testing library, which is the find by query. So you shouldn't wait for the get by query to finish. Or you shouldn't wait for a fire event to finish as well because it's also synchronous. Someone once told me, yeah, Daniel, but I've seen online someone using a wait with fire event. And I'm answered that they are probably looking at the view testing library docs because there the fire event is asynchronous. So instead, you shouldn't use a wait with these queries. Using a wait, wait for with an empty callback. As I mentioned, wait4 is a synchronous util that will wait until the assertion inside of it resolves to true. So looking at this example, we are not passing it an assertion, we are only waiting for nothing. So the code inside of it will wait for the next update on our tests and then go on to checking if our assertion passes. While this might work at some certain cases, it might not work on another of them and other, causing our tests to be flaky. So instead, we should always pass the assertion inside the wait for and wait for it to resolve. Using cleanup. Cleanup is a function that will clean up your entire DOM after each test. We will unmount the things that you render inside of it. So 
As a good practice, you probably should use cleanup after each test, right? The answer is no. If you're using a framework that supports the after each global, then React Testing Library will automatically run cleanup for you after each test. The last example is using wait for with a synchronous query. In this example, we are using wait for where we are waiting until the get by row query returns as a progress bar. This shouldn't be done because, well, we have a specific query to do so. So instead, we should use the find by query instead of using a wait for with a synchronous query. So with all these mistakes, here is a thing that helped us a lot with finding them, which is the plugin for the S wind of the testing library, which has a bunch of rules and best practices and helps you anticipate a couple of mistakes and issues that you might have in the future of your tests. So I guess that's it. So I hope that by the end of this talk, you came to the conclusion that the issue was not React hooks. React hooks didn't break my tests. Implementation details did. Hooks have become a better way of writing and reading React code and, well, in my opinion, they are the future of React. The issue here was indeed implementation details and thanks to the React testing library, our tests became more readable, more easy to write, more fun, for the consequence of, as a consequence of the queries, our components become more accessible and I dare to say that testing became fun. I want to thank React.js Day for having me and I hope to see you all in the QA section right now. My name is Daniel Alfonso and you can find me at any social network by the end of Daniel GC Alfonso. Bye! Thank you, Daniel. That was an awesome talk. Thank you. Very insightful. Uh, I probably have some questions as well. Uh, I would love to yeah. with you about them. So the first one is you talked about queries uh, in the React testing library. Besides the recommended order, is there anything that can help us in the time of deciding what queries to use? Uh, yeah, there's actually a. It's not really. It's recent, but it's not recent. It has a couple of months. I'm going. I'm going to bet on four or five months, which is called the testing playground. Uh, it's pretty great. You can. The basically the concept concept is you grab a copy of your DOM and then you say how oh, and you click on the. For instance, let's imagine that you want to know how could you get a, bot, a button from your component. Mm -hmm. You grab a copy of the DOM for, from it. You can probably use a screen debug. You copy it, you paste it on the test testing playground, and then you click on the button, and then automatically it will say, okay, the query that's ideal for this is this one. Uh, this is pretty great. There are actually a couple of tools in development from what I read on Twitter, which will allow you to do this dynamically while running your code. So this is it, it is really, really, really exciting, and it's going to be great. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. The next one is, how should I test custom React hooks? Well, um, my answer to this is usually you should start with, um, again, I'm going to repeat myself, but with a user-centric perspective. Imagine that you are using a custom hook on your component, on your page. Let's, let's imagine that you have a counter and you have a use counter custom hook. The, in this case, the purpose would be to test firstly the, um, the component that's using the hook and try to gain the most coverage while using it. If for some reason, let's imagine that you have a, a really huge custom hook with um, lots of um, logic, then there's a library called the React Hooks Testing Library that also belongs to the Testing Library family that gives you a couple of utils that you can use to test your custom hooks. Sure, thank you for that answer. Uh, the next one says, when should I use the React Testing Library or something like Cypress? Well, that actually depends. What's, what's actually recommended is you, you try to use the React Testing Library for unit and integration tests, and then use Cypress to end-to-end. -to -end. I'm not saying that you cannot use a Cypress for uh, for unit tests or integration tests. You can do it. Uh, there is also another testing library for Cypress as well, which extends a little bit of the Cypress functionalities. But my usual approach, my usual approach, and the approach that I follow with my team is: if it's in unit test and integration test, we use the React testing library. If it is an end-to-end, -end, then we use Cypress. Thank you, thank you for that. We have one more. Uh, when should we focus on testing 
a specific hook versus component using that hook. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah, that's a bit like what, what what I mentioned previously. Previously, you should always try to test the component first and expect that the things that you are doing in the hook will be reflected on your component. If you are the user when you're testing stuff. And you do exactly the same thing that the user needs and does. If for some reason you have to test more implementation details or some reason, uh, then you can use the React Hooks testing library. Sure. I actually have one question. Uh, sure, go ahead. Yeah. So you mentioned about accessibility. Do you use some sort of uh, libraries to test while doing the unit testing, or is it like just? checking that if that has a label or how do you do it? Maybe some insights would be really yeah, good. That, that's pretty great. We are actually in my current my current um, company where I work right now, TalkDesk. We, in my team, we are trying to focus more on accessibility and are researching more in accessibility tools. But mostly f until right now and what we have focused more on has been, okay, let's imagine that before using the testing library, we were using well, some UI library that gives us custom components. Before that, uh, before the testing library, we wouldn't focus on accessibility. And one of the great things about the React testing library and everything and giving you the perspective of the user is that it will in in incite you and encourage you to to use to be accessible. The queries itself focus on accessibility on accessibility first, and that's one of the greatest thing from the that the React testing library ga gave us is when the, the constant thought in our head, like, why can't I use a query that belongs to the queries accessible to everyone? Is there something wrong with my component? Am I not being accessible enough? Um, but yeah, I guess that regarding the testing part of it, that's what we use the most. <laughs> but for accessibility prof profiling itself, it's still a, a work in progress. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that answer. We have one more question from Nicolo. Uh, and that's how to test our UI components, decoupling them from logic in the hooks. Okay, decoupling them from logic. Yeah, I guess that's mo mostly one of the things that I, <laughs> I repeated a lot. Yeah. It's a user-centric perspective. If you're focusing on the user way, the user way, the what you can change the logic a couple of times, it, as long as the main functionality it's there. But if you're focusing on a test. And being like, okay, I'm the user. I'm testing this as the user. I'm clicking this. I'm expecting this to happen, and not focusing on the logic itself. Then you can test every. You can test your components every, and everything without focusing on the logic. Thank you. Thank you. I hope that answers your question, Nicolo. Uh, so I think we don't have anything else. Uh, and please feel free to reach out to Daniel because he'll yeah. be there in the break sessions. You can reach out to him and ask questions. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Daniel, for thank you for having me. Uh, for talk, that was really awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh.